two, unit two, or sorry, unit three, lesson three, we're forging ahead with the atmosphere and climate. Uh, so please look for the tasks to complete for U3 L3. You can find that under assignments or on the campus homepage in the weekly calendar. Today's date is the 17th of November. As usual, we'll start off with a quick little breakout room chat about something random. The question today is, if you were a superhero, what would your superpower be and why? Think about that for 20 seconds and then go to break up. Don't forget to say hi and check in with the person you're partnered with too. We'll come back together in two minutes. Go for it. Well, thank you everyone for sharing. Uh, next on the docket is checking homework. Uh, there were only kind of two major, well, I mean, technically submit a photo of your notes as well. Uh, but you had to complete the climatograph quiz. Uh, most of you did this in class and uh, answers looked great. Not seeing any confusion over any particular question in the results. Uh, then there was the Hewitt various parts of chapter 26. Again, multiple choice looks great. Um, the last question was a little more in depth. And so I just wanted to see how we're feeling about that. So any ideas? Does anyone know why? Well, first of all, where? Do you find most of the human population, northern or southern hemisphere? Northern. Northern. Anyone know, anyone know why? More land? Is that why? It's Indeed, like that is, yep, that's pretty much what it comes down to. It's pretty ridiculous, actually. So here, I just Google searched northern versus southern hemisphere, and look at that. I mean, there's so much more land mass. Um, the southern hemisphere has Antarctica, which isn't all that big, right? This map already skews it. Australia, the Horn of Africa, and um, the lower part of South America. Not any huge population centers there, right, compared to having Eurasia, Africa, and North America um, in the Northern Hemisphere. And so that's why, you know, even though Earth technically has two different seasons happening at all different times, humans tend to think about the winter months as being like January, December, uh, and the summer months being like June, July, August, just because there's most of our populations in the Northern Hemisphere, and that's the pattern we see. Any other questions or comments or anything you got stuck on on the homework assignments? All righty. Uh, then let's see how we're feeling. Just want to quickly review some of the key points. Make sure you took away what you needed to from the reading before we delve into an activity on climographs. All right, I've closed the tabs down. So again, I'll just need verbal confirmation. Is everyone seeing solar radiation greenhouse effect in front of them? Yeah. 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 All righty, so uh, this is a diagram we're gonna learn a lot more about, uh, but it's basically, you have to think about light as waves, right? It's energy in the form of waves. So this is uh, showing you light right here. Um, and so light uh, exists on a whole wide spectrum, right? It goes uh, basically based on the wavelength, right? Wider waves are things like radio waves, microwaves, that kind of thing. Shorter waves uh, include gamma rays, x-rays, that kind of thing. So, so anyone, can anyone tell me which one do you not want to be exposed to? What do we want to avoid? The shorter wavelength or the longer wavelength? What do you want to stay away from? Shorter. Yes, shorter. this is the dangerous stuff. Uh, if anyone's ever gone to get an x-ray before, you might have had that little lead apron put on top of you, like at the dentist, uh, and they're trying to protect your major organs from the x-rays you're about to expose yourself to, even just for a temporary period of time. Uh, radio waves, like this stuff, we're exposed to those all the time. If you have a radio tower near you, radio waves are bouncing off you right now or bouncing off your house. Not something we usually worry about. Uh, now, as fancy as we humans like to think we are, and our eyes are pretty advanced, but um, can we see a pretty huge spectrum of light or only a small spectrum of light? Small. Yeah, look at that. And that that's kind of pathetic in my opinion. Um, insects and other things can see into ultraviolet and infrared. In fact, it's really cool if you can look at flowers under infrared or ultraviolet and they have whole different patterns sometimes. It's a cool thing to look up on, on um, Google. Anyway, the point is, I want you to think about, um, so red light, that kind of thing versus uh, indigo. So the point is you're gonna have high energy and low energy light. And we're gonna talk about in particular ultraviolet because that's what's coming from solar radiation. So takeaway from that is just thinking of it as high energy. So um, Earth is being bombarded by solar radiation from the sun at all times. And you answered some questions on this, but the key takeaway is that 50%, half of the energy from that is being absorbed by the Earth. Uh, and a lot more of it just gets reflected off. And this to me was what was kind of mind boggling was just that um, 
the warmth that is gathering in our atmosphere is technically not directly due to the solar radiation. It's that solar radiation impacts Earth and then that energy radiates out. So the warmth is actually technically coming from the ground, right, in this kind of uh, infrared low wave form. So it goes from these very um, kind of high um, short wavelength, high energy visible light gets turned into this slower infrared light, which then gets trapped in the gases in our atmosphere, right? There's CO2 and H2O in our atmosphere, which kind of contain these. And so that's what leads to what's called the greenhouse effect, um, which is just a reference to greenhouses, little glass houses we keep plants in. Um, but the same thing's happening in our atmosphere. So green, a greenhouse is surrounded by glass and um, visible light comes through, but infrared slower light that is being emitted by the soil and the plants and everything else gets trapped inside. And so if you were to walk into right from the outside, walk in, it would be a lot warmer inside of that greenhouse. So they call it the greenhouse effect because this is also what's happening in our atmosphere as um, CO2 levels are rising in particular, but um, you know, we need CO2 to keep Earth's surface warm enough for us to survive in as well. It's important to life. Um, and so it's warmed up our atmosphere, but again, it, it's this, um, low slow energy infrared waves that are the main source of warmth that get trapped in our atmosphere. Okay, a quick poll question, just to see how we're feeling. Um, here we go, should be visible on the screen now. Give that a try. All right. Interesting. We're kind of all over the place here, though. Again, it wasn't a very well typed question. So again, how much of the heat um, that warms Earth's atmosphere technically comes the most directly from the, um, what I was getting at was the ground, right? And how visible light's absorbed by Earth and the soil, and then it irradiates out. However, those of you who selected the sun or human activity aren't wrong, right? So human activity is definitely ramping up the presence of methane and CO2, which is warming up our atmosphere. And the sun is technically the ultimate source of all warmth. Um, but what I was getting at is like the most direct source, right? Like what, what is actually contacting our, the gases in our atmosphere and warming them up? It's technically that infrared wavelengths coming from the earth after the earth absorbed the sunlight. Um, so anyway, just kind of interesting perspective I hadn't thought about before. Okay. Next, uh, just a quick review of longitude and latitude. So remember that longitude is going from the North Pole to the South Pole. Um, I actually don't like this diagram because they, they have the zero here, which is called the, um, the prime meridian. Technically, it should be going through Greenwich, England. So it should be kind of over here more where they've got the 30. So I don't know exactly why they were drawing that diagram that way. Um, but uh, latitude is then, um, starting from the equator and slicing earth and layers going all the way up. And so the point is that you get this sort of cross hatching on earth's surface, which is kind of like a coordinate plane, right? We can then, you have an X and a Y axis essentially, and you can locate pretty much any site on our surface or our planet by giving the degrees west or east of the prime meridian and degrees north or south of the equator. And you'll play with this a little bit during your activity on climographs. And what's interesting then is we know that latitude then can influence the temperature, the average temperature. And that's just because of direct exposure to that solar radiation and where a lot of that infrared heat coming from Earth that is absorbed from the visible light is getting trapped. And so, and a lot of you already know this, but at the equator, we consider those tropical climates. They tend to be very hot, very rainy in most places, not all places, um, but temperature doesn't vary hugely, right? You don't have huge changes in season. The sunlight hours don't change often, right? They're like when I was in the Peace Corps in the Gambia, West Africa, I lived here for three years. Um, there was no daylight savings or time change, right? Because it would need to be the sun rose and fell pretty consistently at the same time. But as you move north or south, you hit the temperate zone, which is slightly different and colder, and then the polar regions, which are extremely cold and have insane changes in daylight times, right? Where you can, you can have whole days where the sun never goes down or the sun never comes up, um, all because of Earth's tilt, which we'll get at in a second. 
Now, there's obviously a lot more going on here in terms of wind patterns and ocean currents, and we'll get to that a little bit later, but that's kind of a good general trend to start off thinking about. So again, we've been focusing on climographs. I like climographs because they're a nice little snapshot of general conditions, and I just think it's kind of interesting to look at, you know, look at Kazakhstan versus um, Australia down here, right? Um, Temperature-wise, huge fluctuation. Uh, this is definitely the temperate zone in Kazakhstan, and not as much um, variation in Australia, but completely different time of year, right? Notice that it's very warm uh, in what we think of as the summer months, June, July, and August, but in Australia, that's those are actually their coldest months, and that's because they're in the southern hemisphere. Um, I like looking at these, uh, these are tropical, uh, they're called type A climates. Um, again, look at, there's almost no variation in average temperature <laughs> uh, throughout the entire year. Um, and very warm, right? India's in the 80s, both are in the 80s. But then look at the rain, right? India has their, their monsoon season where it just rains like nuts for a couple months. Um, it's the exact opposite situation in Tanzania and there's, there's some complicated explanations behind that which we'll build up to. And then as you move north and south, you get to polar regions, right, which are super extreme, right? Again, very, very cold temperatures, big fluctuation in places like um, this looks like it's uh, in the Arctic Bay in Canada versus in the Antarctic. Uh, again, being in the southern hemisphere, it's the exact opposite and very, very cold for most, at least it's below freezing for most of the year, um, which is why we don't usually have permanent human settlements in Antarctica. Okay, and then the seasons, which is kind of our, you know, as Earth rotates around the sun, that's a year, um, conditions can change. That's because Earth is actually not rotating perfectly on a north to south straight axis. It's actually tilted by 23.5 degrees. And this is hugely important, right? It, it wobbles on its axis. And so summer, what we think of as some, I'm going to focus on the northern hemisphere here. Uh, southern in the summer, the northern, the northern hemisphere is when... Earth is tilted towards the sun. I used to always think it was when Earth was rotating closest to the sun. That's actually not the case. It's just when the Northern Hemisphere is tilted towards the sun, everyone in the Northern Hemisphere is experiencing summer. And then when the Earth is tilted away from the sun, that's when everyone in the Northern Hemisphere experiences winter and vice versa, right? So it's summer for everyone in the Southern and winter here. And you can kind of see from this diagram too how there's a lot less daylight, right? And that's usually what you hear about most in the calendars, right? Is the uh, the summer solstice and the um, winter solstice, right? So this is the shortest day, winter solstice, um, where we don't get very much sunlight in the northern hemisphere, and then the longest day where we're tilted towards the sun, so we get a lot of sunlight for a period of um, you know a day again, usually in June versus in December. Um, and so again, that's just kind of a nice explanation for the seasons and. Um, you can read more about that as part of the, or no, you already did read about that as homework tonight. One more poll question. Give that a go. See how we're feeling about lat latitude and longitude. All right, 14 out of 14, here we go. Very good, looks like most of you are feeling good that um, from north to south, that is longitude. Um, I don't think it's any longer, but I do think of it as being really long, like north to south pole uh, versus latitude are the ones slicing across. All righty, any questions or comments on that general review of that chapter that you read? Okay, then as promised, we are going to continue with our work on climographs. Just going to show you what you're going to do here really quickly and then let you go to work on it. Um, close all this down here. So uh, on the tasks to complete list, we are now on step four, local climograph activity. What I'd like you to do is essentially look up a climograph for a place of your choice and use Google Sheets to construct, uh, reconstruct the climograph um, and then share that with me as part of an assignment and do a little reflection. So when you click on that right there, making your local climograph, it'll take you to this assignment. Just like with Bob Gardner, please take the time to read each step 
follow the instructions. I tried to be as thorough as possible. You're gonna do some more complicated stuff with Google Sheets this time. Um, these same instructions are also on the Google Sheet you'll be working with. You're gonna open up this website, timeanddate.com, uh, specifically their weather and climate page. So if you ever get navigated away from this, don't panic, just go to weather, click on climate. And um, I'm not sure if, this, if it'll do it, but ideally when you open it, it should pull up your local environment if your computer is aware of where it is. So like mine automatically pulls up Monterey because my computer knows it's in Monterey. Um, and then here's the climate graph. So again, it's showing you the precipitation columns on the bottom. And then this is a maximum and minimum temperature, these weird little orange bars across the front. And so you can look up any place you want. Uh, there's a little search bar in the upper right here. So I used Bangor, Maine. As an example, so if you just type in Bangor, Maine, it pulls it up. It's usually uh, an airport or something like that. That's where they have a lot of these weather stations um, where they're reporting this and updating the status. So there's the climograph of Bangor. But you're going to be opening up this uh, name, local climograph location template Google form. And then again, just follow the instructions. They're all written here. But your goal is to fill in this table down here at the bottom. So as usual, you're going to go to file, make a copy. You're going to delete the copy of name and type in your own name and location, whatever location you choose. So I will move Bank or Maine again, but you can do anywhere. You can do um, uh, where you currently are or where you're from or where you consider home or where you have family or a place you visited. Honestly, the more variation, like, I mean, uh, I'll grade it anyway, but it gets a little boring when I have to look at 20 climate graphs of Monterey. Um, so if you want to vary it up a little bit, choose some unusual locations, that's fine. It gets a little more interesting. Then you're going to graph it. Again, I have all the steps on how to enter the data, the tables pre-prepared for you. If you're doing it right, you should end up with something that looks a little like this, but obviously different for your location. Um, I'll be here listening if you have questions, if you're not sure what to do. You'll submit a link to this uh, Google Sheet as for this assignment, and then there's a link right here to a short quiz. It's just four questions um, where you're going to reflect on the climate graph that you made. So I'm going to time for 20 minutes to get through that. Um, I think that should be a pretty good amount of time, and we'll come back together to check in and move on to one last activity before we go. Again, please let me know if you need help. I'm here listening. I'm happy to share screens and, and walk you through stuff. So go for it.